The 1980s and 90s were a breeding ground for enforcers like Ty Domi, Joey Koster, and Bob Probert. As long as they could drop the gloves and protect the more skilled players, they could enjoy lengthy careers, and many of them did. But there was one monster of a defenseman who could scrap with the best of them, and yet never reached his final form. He lasted only 65 NHL games, but served a whopping 412 minutes in the penalty box. His name? Well, once you hear it, you can't forget it. The missing link, Link Gates, one of the tougher hombres in the NHL. Built like a brick house and deadly with a booming shot, Gates had the skills to become an all-star defenseman, and one who teammate Jeff Audgers attested didn't care if he speared you or took your eye out. But while many players in this era were known for crossing the line, Gates was always on the other side. Alcohol, mischief, and violence, whether in practice or at the bar, followed him through most of his playing career. The resources that NHL players have today weren't as abundant back then, and so Gates quickly wore out his welcome with every team he joined. As another NHL enforcer, Nick Fotiu, once put it, he was the scariest hockey player there ever was. He intimidated everybody, including his coaches. Not much is known about Gates' career before he was drafted to the NHL. From his earliest fights though, it was clear that he could stick up for his teammates and win fans over. The dude was a unit at 6 foot 3 and 215 pounds, and he could go toe to toe with top Western Hockey League enforcers who would play the same role in the NHL. Here he is in white battling Mick Vukoda, and the next season he's the one wearing red and taking it to Tony Twist. Playing for the Spokane Chiefs in his draft eligible year, Gates put up a whopping 313 penalty minutes in just 59 games. But NHL teams back then had a need for some muscle to complement their nifty playmaking, and so at 19 years old, the Vancouver native was ready for the show. The 1988 draft began with a splash, with the Minnesota North Stars selecting future Hall of Famer Mike Madano first overall. For their next pick, Minnesota opted for Snarl over Skill, selecting Link Gates at the end of the second round, even though the night before, he had gotten into a bar fight and two days before that, was arrested after trying to shoot a church bell from its tower. I knew he was different when he showed up for the draft with two black eyes, said Madano. As for North Star's general manager Lou Nanny, quote, In the first round we drafted Mike Madano to protect the franchise. In the second round we drafted Link to protect Mike. In the third, we should have drafted a lawyer to protect Link. As soon as he put on that gorgeous jersey, Link Gates literally came out swinging. Here's a fight in the preseason against Chicago's David Mackey. Finding his own way to make an impact, the burly defenseman cracked the North Star's opening night lineup. After earning a spearing major and a game misconduct in just his third game, his first fight came just two games later against Joey Koser, one of the greatest ever to drop the gloves. One more fight and seven more games later, his NHL season came to an end. He continued playing for the North Stars affiliate, the Kalamazoo Wings of the IHL. In 37 games, he racked up 192 penalty minutes, but hey, he scored three goals. But also during this season, he was arrested for drunk driving and was subsequently suspended. The missing link stayed in the IHL for nearly the next two years, earning 540 penalty minutes in 88 games with the Wings and the Kansas City Blades. He also played in five NHL games. During the middle of a 9-0 thrashing from the Red Wings, he engaged Koser in a rematch, his last fight as a North Star, and at the end of the game, he picked up a charging penalty and a misconduct. After 17 games, a mere two assists, and 86 penalty minutes in Minnesota, Gates was about to get a change of scenery. In the 1991 offseason, Gates found himself not only on a different team, but a new franchise, the San Jose Sharks. Now he wasn't traded or released, but alongside four North Stars and a multitude of Kalamazoo Wings and other prospects, was eligible for the Sharks to select in the dispersal draft, just explaining that would require a whole separate video. Anyway, because expansion teams back then had vastly inferior rosters, the Sharks had an opportunity for Gates to not just start the year on the Cow Palace ice, but also play alongside future Hall of Fame defenseman Doug Wilson. He probably had the hardest shot in the league, said Wilson in a 2003 ESPN interview. Comparing him to Dallas Stars Stanley Cup winning captain Darian Hatcher is quite fair. Just like with the North Stars, Gates took his first swings as a shark in his fifth game, taking on Alan Stewart. Very tough battlers. In his eighth game, he set an NHL personal best with 35 penalty minutes, a fight off the opening faceoff with Randy McKay, and then in the same third period sequence, a slash, a fight with Dave Maley, and two game misconducts. I didn't even know that was possible, not to mention he wasn't even suspended. Then on February 21st, he went to war against Gino Ochik, picking up a first period roughing, followed by two separate instances of a fight and a misconduct. And in his final game that year, he was suspended 10 games for instigating a brawl after the game had ended. Man, I wish I could find that clip. 
In total, Gates played 48 games, over half the season, and he'd taken on the rogues gallery of enforcers from Ochik to Joey Koser to Tony Twist to Kelly Bookberger and maybe the GOAT, Bob Probert, among others. Good Lord. Oh my goodness, you talk about two big boys and Gates landed several punches on Probert. Had he appeared in the same 76 games that Dave Schultz played in a 472 penalty minute season in 1974, the missing link could have conceivably racked up over 500 minutes in the box and set a league record. For context, in the over 100 year history of the NHL, only three players have ever eclipsed 400 penalty minutes in a season. Compare that to this past year when Pat Maroon led the NHL with 150. Despite being nowhere near the team's leading scorers, Sharks fans and the media couldn't get enough of Gates. Longtime Sharks radio broadcaster Dan Rusinowski wrote, Link walked around with a crowd of at least 20 kids following him. That had never happened before and I've never seen it since. He was like the Pied Piper. But despite his allure, he never earned the full trust of his teammates. Perry Berezin recounted a game against the Red Wings in which he and Gates took three shifts together and were scored on every time. After the third goal, Gates turned to his teammate and he said, Perry, you know what? I just don't feel like playing tonight. They took one more shift together, got scored on again, shocker, and immediately afterward, Gates went straight to the locker room. His lack of focus and discipline strained his relationships even where he thrived the most. Assistant coach Drew Remenda shared that Gates always had an incident every couple of weeks, from reckless speeding to throwing a TV out of a hotel window. The staff spent more time and more effort talking about how we can help Link than we did with any of our other players, he said. We all thought that the payoff could have been tremendous. But try as they did, the Sharks couldn't tame the out-of-control 23-year-old. At the end of the season, when he was riding with a drunk friend, he was flung from the passenger seat of a Camaro going 80 miles per hour on Highway 101. He had injured his brainstem, putting him in a semi-comatose state. Doctors told his mom he might die. After eight days, Gates woke up, partially paralyzed and without memory of the accident. He spent six weeks in the hospital and two months working with therapists to regain movement and speech. He later reflected in 2011, not a day goes by that I don't wish that I didn't get in my car accident because it changed everything. And what amplified his struggles to an insurmountable degree was alcohol. Just months after the accident, for the second time in his NHL career, Gates was arrested for drunk driving. He missed the whole season, except for five IHL games between the Blades and the Nashville Knights. The Sharks moved on from the former second rounder, trading him just before the start of next season to the Edmonton Oilers for a 10th round pick. At just 24 years old, Link Gates' NHL career was over. He would bounce around between, from what I counted, 16 teams over 13 years, flocking to several different leagues ranging from Anchorage, Alaska to Mexico City. His volatility, whether on or off the ice, always came out ahead of any skill that he had left, and so the longest he ever lasted with one team was a mere 35 games. Here are just some of his most notorious incidents. Nashville Knights coach and former NHL enforcer Nick Fatiu recounted how Gates wouldn't let up one bit in practice, crossing the line between battling for a job and endangering his teammates. I've seen him cross-check kids in practice and knock them cold, he said. I've seen him put people out with one punch. He'd win fights and wouldn't stop. He also recalled how Gates and his teammates were partying at someone's house when he took them hostage. Fatiu showed up and took a beer out of Gates' hand, and Gates started fighting him. The cops came to settle things down, but later Gates showed up at Fatiu's house. The coach recounted, five in the morning, he comes over to my house and wants to fight. I say no. Eight o'clock, he comes back. He wants to go to breakfast. Following Nashville, Gates returned to Northern California and took a shot with the Sacramento River Rats of Roller Hockey International, a league that several former NHLers played in. But eight games into his stint, he was kicked off the team after beating up a trainer. Later that year, Gates joined up with the San Antonio Iguanas of the Central Hockey League. In 13 games, he had amassed an astonishing 156 penalty minutes, and in his final game, brought his stick over his head and fractured Dallas Freeze defenseman Frank LaScala's wrist. The league permanently banned him. During his pit stop in San Antonio, he also spent time in a jail cell following what I can only assume was an off-ice brawl. Then in 99, in Miramichi, New Brunswick, police found an unconscious metals miner whom Gates had been drinking with and later pummeled and left in a snowbank. One local said of the miner's condition, he looked like he was wearing a Halloween mask, and I actually had to leave out the rest of his statement. Gates spent four months in prison, getting into six fights, and was prohibited from entering the US for several years. He'd never play another game there. 
Two years later, he'd embark on a tour of several teams in what is now called the LNAH, a low-level pro league in Quebec featuring former NHL enforcers. Gates was a popular draw who, in the case of the Trois-Rivières Vikings, attracted an additional 400 spectators inside their 3,000-seat arena. While playing with Thetford Mines Pro Lab, he didn't see the ice too much, as his coach didn't like enforcers. This might be his most infamous moment, but at least it's on a much lighter note. During a March 2005 game, Gates rode the bench for the first two periods. He was so detached from the action that during second intermission, he changed out of his gear, walked up to the concession stand, bought a burger, and ate it behind the bench. He was suspended for the rest of the year. That didn't keep him out of fighting for long though. That summer, he participated in a made-for-TV tournament called Battle of the Hockey Enforcers. Basically, picture something like the fighting league from the second Goon film. Gates joined fellow NHL alums Kent Carlson and Jason Simon in a 15-man tournament, but he had to retire during his first round matchup after getting knocked down twice and experiencing concussion-like symptoms. That was his last on-ice bout that I can trace, coming at age 37. Following his retirement from hockey, it looked like Gates had settled down and was living a less violent life. As of 2011, he was married and had a child, and he was one year sober and working for a recycling company near his hometown in Surrey, British Columbia. He recounted, when I met the boss, the first thing he said was, hey, you fought Probert. But while his on-ice legend had lived on, his struggles never completely vanished either. In 2012, he was charged with assaulting a man in his 70s at a Dairy Queen in BC. The victim unfortunately drowned in Seton Lake several weeks later, so the assault charge was dropped. And that was the last story I could find on Link Gates, now 55 years old. As I mentioned at the beginning, the NHL now has much better resources for players experiencing mental health and substance abuse problems. Had those been available for Gates, for all we know, we could be mentioning his name in the same breath as other great defensemen in his time, maybe a tier below the likes of Chris Pronger, Scott Stevens, and Chris Chelios. As teammate Kelly Kissio said, Gates was an exceptional physical specimen. He was a monster. He could shoot the puck. He could skate. He could handle it. And as Gates' coach Nick Fatiu told ESPN in 03, he should be one of the top 10 defensemen in the NHL right now. Who's your favorite NHL enforcer ever? Let me know in the comments and feel free to suggest other players and topics that I should cover. Thanks for watching everyone. I'm Nick and I'll catch you twisters later.